welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello and welcome back to Ask Historians podcast, episode 149. Today we're going to be talking about the opium wars themselves and the fallout that they had on Chinese history and historiography going forward for the next several centuries. I'm joined once again by user Enclave Microstate, and we are going to pick up where we left off from our previous episode. Okay, so we've mentioned all of these disparate causes, we've mentioned the context, we've talked about the situation that both sides find themselves in. How does so we've mentioned the British have made this plan, they're going to wage the war before Parliament can even raise an objection. How does it go? So, I mean, the initial outbreak of war is, is there's kind of two ways to view the outbreak of war. But one way is to view it in kind of the South China context. And that the war really begins when Elliot pulls all the merchants out of Canton, occupies Hong Kong Island to use as a harbour. Um, this is in the early months of 1839. And eventually, the first proper shots of the war happen when, um, after Lin Zersu orders that the merchants sign a bond agreeing never to trade in opium again. Elliot, who is awaiting instructions from Britain, decides that he's not going to allow the merchants to sign this bond yet. And even in the case of merchants like the Quakers, who don't want to deal in opium and want to continue trading in textiles and tea. And so Elliot, uh, and so actually the first proper shots of the war happen when Elliot tries to stop a Quaker ship from running his blockade of Canton and Qing ships try to protect this British merchantman against the British fleet. And what eventually, and basically you have a state of standoff in South China until reinforcements arrive from India. But you can also look at it from the British perspective, because there is still this potential that at the high level of political power in Britain, that war can be stopped early on. Um, in April 1840, James Graham tries to launch a no confidence vote against Lord Melbourne. And Melbourne had said before the vote that if he got a majority of less than 10, he would resign. After a lengthy number of impassioned speeches from all sides, um, including, as mentioned, George Staunton and also the historian Thomas Macaulay, who was the Secretary for War in the Whig cabinet, uh, Melbourne's government won the vote by only nine. Seemingly, this was reason enough to rescind his entire earlier promise, and he decided to stay on as Prime Minister, and the war with China went ahead. The war can be divided into roughly three phases. Um, initially, uh, this, the first phase proper is from about June 1840 to January of 1841. Um, Elliot sends a squadron to the island of Chusan, off the trading port of Ningbo, captures the island, over, and, I mean, this happens over the course of, a, of less than an hour. I mean, they bombard the island for a bit, the governor capitulates, and it is taken. Um, the fleet splits in two. One goes southwards to basically secure Canton by taking at the coastal defences. The other delivers an ultimatum to the Daoguang Emperor, saying, this is what Lin Zersu has done, we demand redress. And the Daoguang Emperor appoints a Manchu banner official named Qishan, who travels southwards and actually negotiates a deal with Charles Eliot, known as the Convention of Tuen Pi. The Convention of Tuen Pi agrees to the following terms, that Britain will be leased the island of Hong Kong, that they will receive a six million dollar indemnity, which covers the cost of the confiscated opium, and that there would now be official direct lines of communication between the two governments. What's really interesting about the, con the Tuen Pi Convention is that it doesn't fundamentally seek to overturn the Canton system, Hong Kong, being close to Canton, is more suited than McCartney's original plan of Chusan for trading with Canton. Um, the $6 million indemnity is exactly how much the British owe the merchants. And the direct official lines of communication isn't supplanting anything in the Canton system, it's adding to it by offering a way to defuse those tensions that had caused the war. The reason this fails is twofold. The first is that Lord Palmerston doesn't like that the deal is too lenient, 
The second is that the Daogong Emperor has a change of heart and decides that he doesn't want to negotiate with the British after all and orders Qishan to start attacking. So between March and May of 1841, um, fighting goes on around Canton and the British occupy the city. During this time, there's a rather unusual case known as the San Yuan Li incident, in which um, a group of militias, which had proliferated across China since the White Lotus Rebellion, because if the government wasn't going to protect them, they may as well protect themselves. Um, this group of militias came out and attacked the British in the rain when their muskets wouldn't fire. Uh, and this later got held up as a massive uh, case of sort of proper nationalist feeling, um, but as I'll discuss later, there's a certain complexity to it. But shortly after the capture of Canton, Elliot, who had already been grating <laughs> Palmerston for some time, gets replaced with um, Henry Pottinger, who is altogether more bellicose, and he consolidates the British position around Canton. And even, and in fact, the war continues when the Whigs get defeated by uh, Robert Peel's Tories. Um, the Tories basically come to power on the platform that the Whigs weren't winning the war fast enough, despite, of course, having been the faction against war in the first place. And so the Tories you know, basically all give Pottinger more reinforcements, and he keeps fighting along the coast from August until the winter, after a failed Qing counterattack early in 1842, he then moves up the Yangtze, and he threatens the major Chinese city of Nanjing by August. So this forces the Qing into a negotiating position, and the Daogang Emperor, having had to deal with endless defeats, um, decides that there is eventually just basically nothing he can do, and sends two officials, um, both Manchus, one is Qiang and the other is named Ibu, to Nanjing to negotiate with the British. So, how did, we've seen Britain was wildly successful based off what you've said. You said the Qing failed their counterattacks, the British captured places like Chuson, Hong Kong, Canton, relatively easily. Um, and then we're able to campaign into into the interior of certain ways. So why was Britain so successful in this war? Yeah, I mean, to put what, uh, an additional metric to put this into perspective, um, Britain suffered at most 1,300 casualties, 500 of which were deaths from disease, um, whereas Qing casualties are estimated at something like 7,000. Traditionally, it's all about the technology. The British have, among other things, um, one of their major ships is an iron-hulled steamer, the Nemesis. And A, it's iron-hulled, so against low-velocity cannon shots, it does quite well. Uh, secondly, it's a steamer, so it doesn't have to rely on the wind. But, in fact, a lot of the technological advantages that Britain is properly utilising in this war have existed since about 1700. Um, uh, the, you know... They're still using flintlock muskets. Their main ships are you know, 74-gun ships of the line that wouldn't have looked out of place at Trafalgar. Um, really, the major advantages the, Br the British have, A, much better training. Um, the British army is a permanent standing army, whereas the Qing armies are mostly, with the exception of the Eight Banner Garrisons, um, basically manpower support for civil functions. These are basically Qing soldiers are also involved in things like law enforcement, their mail couriers, etc. So they aren't as well trained. The big factor though really is the Royal Navy. The simple fact is that even though it's mostly sail powered, square rigged ships are more capable of sailing in adverse conditions than junk rigged ships and also they're much better armed. So the British were actually numerically superior at most battles of the Opium War, simply because they were getting there faster than Qing troops could reinforce. At the same time, in terms of kind of why the Qing are eventually forced into a negotiating position, um, one Chinese historian, Mao Haijian, in fact, argued slightly controversially in the 90s that the only viable route, given that military superiority, was for the Qing to surrender at the gate. But the reason they didn't was that officials couldn't admit defeat in front of the emperor. 
So what they did was they lied until it was literally impossible to keep lying because it was very obvious that they lost. So what often happened was the emperor was being fed false information and he kept assuming that he had the capability to inflict defeats on the British, but that incompetent officials in the provinces were ev eventually getting overawed. One additional little factor that has to be brought up is the ethnic tensions. Um, in Canton, it had been occasionally asserted that British victories were being facilitated by these fifth columnists of Han traitors, um, basically Chinese collaborators who had risen up and decided to support the British against the Manchus. And this paranoia, which evidently must have come also in part from earlier crises like the Eight Trigrams attempt to assassinate the Jiating Emperor in 1813, um, lead to cases where Manchu officials got incredibly paranoid and distrusted Chinese civilians. The most infamous case was in the city of Zhenxiang, which housed a Manchu garrison, where the Manchu general basically went out and inflicted summary punishments, both capital and corporal, on Chinese civilians who, basically for looking askance at a Manchu, which, of course, the more these executions happen and the more they're afraid of the Manchus, is of course going to happen more often. Um, you mentioned that the the British hope of a Chinese uprising against the Manchus was rather far-fetched, to put it mildly, but there does seem to have been paranoia about the Chinese, um, the Chinese on behalf of the Manchus as well. Can you elaborate a little bit why, why was that British hope not materializing, even though on both sides there seems to have been an assumption of some sort of hostility towards the Manchus from the larger population? I think there were genuinely a couple of incidents where there was what might seem to be some degree of Chinese resistance against the Manchus, but I think the major thing is that it was almost invariably of quite a local character. It wasn't like there was anyone proposing a national-scale revolt, like what would happen with the Taiping later. So, for example, when the British attacked um, Chusan in June of 1840, the garrison commander is incredulous that they're coming here because he sees what's happened in Canton as a local issue. So in this particular case, I mean, Qing official forces are reluctant to fight the British because they don't see it as their problem, because it's not their locale. In the case of the San Yuanli militia incident, what's really interesting is that San Yuanli um, militias put up placards saying that they are going to resist anyone who threatens their livelihoods, not just the British, but also the Qing, if it would come to it. But this isn't a declaration of rebellion against the Qing state. It's simply a declaration of uh, that the militias are going to protect their own immediate local interests. So while there's a certain apathy or even antipathy towards the Manchus, it isn't out of some sort of unifying national enmity. It's more of a case of local concerns that they see the Manchu court as failing to deal with. So once all of this is wrapped up, we've mentioned that the emperor had this previous peace offering that he later, uh, I don't want to say reneged on, but disfavored and chose to try and prosecute the war by other means. How does the final treaty that ends the war match up to the previous offer? In some respects, it takes the old offers. Um, it does still demand the cession of Hong Kong. It does still call for direct communication between, between officials. And it also um, calls for a $6 million indemnity to cover the cost of opium. But there are more terms to it. The first thing is that there's an additional... Uh, 15 million dollars of indemnities to cover basically war costs and basically other perceived expenditures. Um, it also calls for an amnesty for apparent collaborators. I mean, the British clearly are aware and concerned about the incidents like the Zhenjiang massacres. And crucially, it opens up four more ports. Uh, these are the ports of Fuzhou, Xiamen, also known as Amoy in um, the local language. 
Ningbo, and crucially, Shanghai. But what it doesn't call for is any sort of move towards legalising opium. And that's the very, uh, that's in some ways the odd thing about the end of the Opium War. If it is indeed the Opium War, then why isn't you know, legalising opium, opening China to opium, on the cards? The simple fact is it's in nobody's interests. The negotiators aren't going to be offering opium, because obviously that's not in their interests. The Whigs, who had started the war, constantly insisted it wasn't about opium. So they couldn't claim it couldn't have opium in the deal, so neither Elliot nor Pottinger were given instructions to legalise opium in, as part of the peace deal. The Tories, of course, had protested that the war was about legalising opium, so they couldn't legalise opium without coming off as hypocrites either. So what comes out of the Nanjing settlement is something which basically opens up more ports, but still fundamentally retains a lot of the Canton system style arrangements and doesn't do anything towards what had been the inciting incident, which was opium. And in many ways this is what the Qing wanted. Um, the Qing negotiator Qiong um, sweet talked the British into thinking they were getting a very good deal, but privately what he said was, I haven't changed the, the underlying nature of the Canton trade. All I've done is just made it happen in more ports. So the British think they've got what they want, and we have got what we didn't, well, we haven't given away what we didn't want to give away. So, and so that, obviously, Kiyo is someone who gets um, lauded on both sides of the aisle by the Qing for being such an effective negotiator, and by the British for having been so conciliatory. Well, so then that somewhat begs the question, what were the Qing trying to preserve that they didn't get away? And how were British war aims either achieved or not achieved based on this action? Because uh, it sounds to me, um, uninformed observer that I am, opening up more ports was not something that the Qing wanted to do. In I, the exact motives for why the Tiananmen Emperor specifically stopped trade at Ningbo is um, up in the air slightly, but one of the issues may well have been simply economies of scale prevailed in Canton. The other thing was that, of course, the British had been demanding more ports, but not necessarily much modification to the way, to the specific means by which trade was conducted. So the Qing negotiators were probably quite aware when the British handed over this list of terms that mostly was just open more ports, but not necessarily alter the trade system, that this was a deal they could accept as long as they you know, expanded their customs infrastructure while giving the British entirely what they wanted. Well, so then this kind of, what was the point of the war then? Why not, I mean, now we're getting into counterfactuals, and why not X and Y and so on. Uh, but why did the war need to be fought? If the Chinese were both amenable to opening more ports, and that's what the British wanted, was it just a breakdown in communications combined with these series of diplomatic incidents that prompted a war? Or was there... You've talked about how this was a, contin a contingent view of the Opium Wars, that this was a long process that culminated with, around the Opium trade, but didn't necessarily happen because of the Opium trade. That's just the inciting incident for it. So, yeah. can you walk us through this? I, I think the contingency approach holds water simply because if you look at things like uh, the Napier incident, war could have happened at any time. And if you look at the priorities of negotiators like Elliot and Pottinger and later on Kian, basically all they want is the war to end, for trade to continue, and for a minimal amount of disruption to basically what had been going on, with the exception really of Pottinger wanting more ports. Why, yeah, why couldn't this have been done peacefully? I, one of the big things is that Britain wasn't really demanding more ports until um, 1841. So during the initial rounds of negotiation, that isn't being, that isn't on the table. It's only when, finally, in August 1842, Pottinger turns up with ships on the Yangtze that, basically, the Qing 
uh, Britain is very clearly dictating the terms and the Qing either go along with it or and maybe try and sweeten the deal in some places. That, yeah, then opening more ports becomes part of the package. Okay, I see. So, can we talk a little bit, what was the fallout from this war? Um, what was the reaction in Britain and what was the reaction in the Qing? The reaction in the Qing is very hard to tell because, uh, in part, it's not that, it's not necessarily that big a deal. And I, you know, controversial statement, <laughs> yeah, to some extent, but like, it's not like the White Lotus Rebellion. It's not like the Eight Trigrams Rebellion. It's not like there's an existential threat to the Qing Empire being posed by what is, in many ways, British raiding along the coast and a major river. Um, and what eventually happens is that uh, literati groups like former Prince Spring Purification members basically re-rationalise the war as basically, you know, everything would have been fine with less meddling by the central imperial government, and that is the lesson we need to draw from this. So I mean, that, if, if there is a fallout in terms of Qing official response, that's it. In Britain, um, the response is oddly optimistic, when I say oddly. But oddly relative to the initial outrage about what seemed to be an utterly unjust conflict from the popular press. Um, over the course of the war, stories of Chinese atrocities had basically created an environment in which it was more readily accepted that basically China was somehow this backwards nation and that the recent war had finally kind of opened China's eyes and that as a result of this China was now properly on equitable footing with Britain. So one interesting um, side effect of this was um, the Keying voyage. A group of British um, merchants in Hong Kong bought a Chinese junk loaded it up with artefacts and a group of performers, and tried to sail it to London. And the ship Keying was named after the British pronunciation of the Manchu Keung. Um, the, the ship went slightly off course and spent a couple of months in New York first. Um, but when it got to London, one of the performers evidently had decided that he would present himself as a Mandarin. And he turned up at the Great Exhibition <laughs> allegedly as the formal diplomatic representative of China. And everyone believed him because there was this willingness to believe China is now part of the current global system. So there is this kind of optimism in the 1840s about you know, China being part of the world now. But there are problems, obviously. Um, so, firstly, there are things that Britain wanted that it didn't quite get that it negotiates for. One of them is the big thing, extraterritoriality. Um, this is the right for British subjects to be tried under British law, even in China. Um, and they get this in what's known as the Supplementary Treaty of the Bogue in 1843. This also gives them what's known as most favoured nation status, which meant that if anyone else got a different trade concession, Britain would automatically be entitled to it as well. And the Qing, basically not wanting to start another trade war, also end up giving most favoured nation status to France, the US, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, basically any country that asks for it in the years between um, 1842 and 1846, more or less, gets it. And on top of that, I mean, the Nanjing settlement isn't, as we said, it doesn't fundamentally alter the core structure. While the de jure monopoly ends, the simple fact that these merchant firms are so powerful already means that, at least in Canton, it's the same merchants as before, just they're not officially licensed as a monopoly. And on top of that, as you noted, I mean, it's just that there's more ports. It's not like there's more goods. So through the 1840s, the growth of trade isn't significantly different from what it was in the 1830s. So, how do we get from, so there are problems with the peace settlement, um, how does this spiral into a second trade war when the Qing seem very preoccupied with avoiding this more or less 
I, I won't say at all costs, but you did mention that they're essentially they're handing out this most favored nation status. Um, what what starts the spiral into the next war? So, I mean, as with the spiral into the first war, there is the Chinese angle and there is the foreign angle. The Chinese angle is simply put that the Qing are become incredibly vulnerable in the 1850s. Um, the main cause mostly being the Taiping Rebellion, or the Taiping Civil War, as I normally call it. Um, the Taiping Civil War, we don't need to go in-depth into the causes. It's started by a failed scholar in southern China who, basically, after a series of feverish visions and exposure to Protestant missionary tracts, becomes convinced that he is the second son of the Abrahamic god, and has been given a divine mission to cleanse China from sin and to expunge the quote-unquote demons. This, eventually, he concludes, are the Manchus. Um, and he rallies together the disaffected populace of South China and launches a revolt that basically migrates towards, eventually, Nanjing, which he captures in 1853. Uh, this is a huge strain on Qing finances, it devastates several provinces, it you know, destroys several Qing armies, and it also opens up power vacuums in several regions that allow more revolts to spawn, the most significant of which is the so-called Red Turban Revolt in Guangdong province. The commissioner for Guangdong province, sorry, uh, the governor general of Guangdong and Guangxi provinces, Ye Mingchun, um, is very active in prosecuting a rebel suppression campaign, and he eventually, by 1856, has squeezed the remaining rebels into a very small pocket of Guangdong. Um, but throughout this, he is also trying to raise huge amounts of customs revenues to try and fund the Qing war effort against, war effort against the Taiping. So in... Um, in 1850. Two, he is able to extract 2.2 million taels from Canton. Uh, this is 0 0.7 million more than had been collected in the 1830s. So even though a lot of trade has moved to Shanghai since the Nanjing settlement, um, you know, that is illustrative of just how significant the efforts to which the Qing were going to collect more customs revenues. But as part of this program, the Qing are very eager to also prosecute against piracy, which is threatening to take that away. And this leads, in October of 1856, to the Arrow Incident, in which Yeomingchen seizes a ship called the Arrow. It's a very small vessel, only about 14 crew plus a European captain, um, which he suspected of harbouring pirates. The captain of the ship was an Irishman named Thomas Kennedy, who protested that the ship was registered to a Chinese businessman in Hong Kong, and therefore was flying the British flag at the time, and so Yeoming Chen's seizure of the ship was a violation of international treaty obligations. When asked who this Chinese proprietor was, Kennedy responded that he couldn't remember, and as it turns out, the ship was no longer registered in Hong Kong, in fact it hadn't been for a couple of months, and so couldn't have been flying the British flag legally anyway and so Ye Ming-chun was fully within his rights to take it. But, going from the foreign angle, the British and the French and the Americans had for, had obviously not been fully pleased with the Nanjing settlement, because, of course, as it turns out, they weren't making the trade any more favourable for themselves, they were just spreading it out across China. So there was already merchant agitation for a war, on top of that, um, British civil servants in the colonies, like um, Harry Parks, were particularly eager to also agitate for another war because they saw the expansion of trade as supporting British government finances. On top of that, we also have to consider what's been alluded to, a sort of counterfactual angle, which is, you know, why didn't they support the Taiping instead? Why go on an independent war? And... What seems to have been the major issue was that in 1853 and 1854, when the British, French, and American delegations did try to negotiate with the Taiping, um, the Taiping just basically declared that they weren't interested um, and acted more or less high and 
in the British view, as high and mighty as the Manchus had before. So, basically, the hopes of a pliant typing regime being supported by the British were basically naively optimistic. Britain would be better off fighting the Qing and seeing what came out of the Civil War afterwards. I think adding to that was simply the fact that typing in fighting in the middle of 1856 had left them significantly weakened. So when the Arrow incident happened in October 1856, um, there was clearly significant scepticism about the typing's chances. Um, I mean, on top of that, gosh, one thing I forgot was, um, of course, the fact that the French are involved in the Second Opium War. And, of course, th that's quite odd. The French aren't selling opium. The British and the Americans are. Um, the Americans, incidentally, are getting theirs from Turkey rather than India. So why do the French want to get involved? And one major thing that we tend to forget is also religion. Missionaries had been involved directly in the opium trade for some time, and also independently of that. Um, you know, this was an age in which huge numbers of Europeans and Americans thought that it was you know, the duty of Christendom to expand Christendom by converting the heathen. And the inciting incident that got France into the Second Opium War was the execution of a Catholic missionary named Auguste de Chapdelaine in Guangxi. So along with the sort of economic current that seems to be motivating Britain, there is also a religious current that is very strong for France. So we've got two European powers. Uh, you mentioned Britain and France and also the Americans are all interested in seeing the expansion of trade, not just the spreading it around a little bit into more cities. So we mentioned there's these series of incidents, such as the Arrow Incident. What actually kickstarts the the war itself? Was it this the Arrow Incident that you mentioned? Uh, we've talked about some of the underlying causes, the uh, unsatisfaction with the peace terms and these religious dimensions as well. Um, but when did this, or how did this go from dissatisfaction and diplomatic incidents into another war. So the Arrow incident is pretty much the inciting incident. Um, it's why the war is also known as the Arrow War. Um, basically, Parks go, goes up to Canton, demands the release of prisoners, and when Yeoming Chun refuses, he storms the city and raises the Union Jack over Yeoming Chun's office. He then almost immediately retreats because British forces are not going to be strong enough to be to resist getting overwhelmed by Qing reinforcements. Um, but unlike in 1840, there isn't a significant debate about this. War has started in China, and basically a British government that has realised that it kind of didn't get the best deal out of 1842 um, is perfectly willing to send more troops in, both from Britain and from India, to support the ongoing war in southern China. I said war is mostly localised to Canton until 1857, um, so the French support the British and the city is stormed and Yeoming Chun is captured. He is then taken to Kolkata where it's assumed that he might be used as a sort of bargaining ship, um, but in fact Yeoming Chun was, got criticised later for not committing suicide, um, which was what Sort of an upstanding official was supposed to do if captured by quote unquote foreign barbarians. Um, in fact, Yeoming Chen seems to have regarded his own role potentially as a mediator as well. Um, but this all this all went sour basically. Um, the, the Qing tried to get Qiong to negotiate with the British again, but in Yeoming Chen's files, they found Qian's private correspondence in which he talked about how gullible the British were. So that didn't go over too well, and instead the British and French go all the way up to uh, the Dagu forts that uh, protected the port at Tianjin, which is the port that serves Beijing. After this, they impose well, two treaties are imposed on the Qing. The first is the Treaty of Tianjin, and the Treaty of Tianjin um, opens new 
uh, treaty ports, including, strangely enough, Nanjing, which was, of course, the Taiping capital. So I think this gives away how much the British and French were not particularly confident of Taiping success. Um, they, the treaty also demanded um, that the Qing stop prescribing Christianity, affirmed extraterritoriality, um, it also permitted uh, navigation rights on the uh, Yangtze, but also provided that um, foreign powers would not legally trade with the Taiping. <laughs> it finally actually added the, um, the provision for official communications by adding a legation quarter in Beijing for foreign diplomats, um, ended the monopoly system, added an indemnity, as usual, and also, um, just a really minor linguistic point, said that the Chinese weren't to refer to foreigners as barbarians anymore. Um, yeah. The other major treaty was the Treaty of Aigun, because Russia is hanging in the background here, and it seizes the land that it had originally claimed before the Treaty of Nerchinsk for itself, as part of the Treaty of Aigun. So this gets imposed on the Qing as well. The Xianfeng Emperor, after the foreigners leave, uh, decides not to ratify the treaties. It's not entirely clear why, but it's noted that the Xianfeng Emperor's policy was very much Taiping first. In his own words, sort of, the British, well, the barbarians, may hack at our limbs, but the rebels strike for our heart. He was less concerned about placating the foreigners than he was about trying to just crush the rebels who were the real existential threat. And so what's quite interesting is that, in fact, at the time, while the war was regarded as, well, the first stage of this war was regarded as a separate war that was over, and the British and French, when they went to war with China again in 1858, were kind of fighting a new war to make sure that China agreed to the deal imposed at the end of the last war. Um, there's a pamphlet quite... Uh, nicely titled, Is Our War with Tartars or with the Chinese, which begins with the point that no one is entirely sure when war resumed. Um, so the first step of that second phase is in 1859, when the British and French try to storm the Dagu forts again. Um, for whatever reason, they decide that the obvious thing to do is sail up close to them instead of bombarding them from a distance, um, and they basically run into a set of traps set up by the Ming, the Manchu general, um, sorry, Mongol general, Sunga Rin Chen. And so, in fact, in 1859, the one expedition the British and French are trying to make to Beijing is a disastrous failure. Um, they go back in 1860 with a force of about 10,000 troops, as well as 3,000 um, labourers hired in Canton, known as the Canton Coolie Corps. So these are, you know, Chinese supporters of the British ex British and French expedition to Beijing. Um, so as noted, you know, Qing fears are not unfounded, but they are certainly extreme. Um, the Anglo-French expedition captures Tianjin and marches towards Beijing. The Qing pr basically receive a British and French delegation pretending to be prepared to negotiate, but they in fact capture the delegation and imprison them, where they're tortured for several days. And when the British recapture this delegation, um, when they take Beijing, which has been evacuated by the imperial court, um, basically there is a huge outcry from the British and French armies, and they go off and sack the imperial summer palace complex. After this, the Convention of Peking, or Convention of Beijing, uh, leads to the ratification of the Treaty of Tianjin, which um, added, A, that Britain would gain control of the Kowloon Peninsula in Hong Kong, that um, all property of Christian missionaries that had been uh, confiscated in proscriptions was to be returned, and also increased the territorial concession to Russia. So I mean, that is basically the deal that ends, directly speaking, the Second Opium War. But, like with the Treaty of Nanjing, there is one obvious thing 
that is not there, which is opium. And the weird thing, or at least the interesting thing, is that opium got legalised very quietly around 1858. Sometimes this has been asserted that opium was an unofficial, sort of an implicit term of the Treaty of Tianjin, but I mean the text of the treaty doesn't say that, and on top of that you'd think that if the war was about opium, then the Xianfeng Emperor, in refusing to ratify the Treaty of Tianjin, would not have somehow agreed to an implicit conclusion of the treaty when he refused to agree to the explicit ones. It seems simply that the Qing was so strapped for cash that they legalised opium as a way of getting more money out of it. Um, and the other thing about, you know, is this an opium war? Why would France be willing to increase Britain's economic advantage by ordering the legalisation of opium? Um, so basically, that's why I often call it the, se the Arrow War instead of the Second Opium War, that kind of the role of opium is much less apparent even than for the first. So what is... We've talked about the opium, the lack of presence of opium, really, in the Second Opium War. Um, what are some of the other fallouts? I mean, when you have these territorial concessions, um, are more ports opened up, how did, does trade start to actually increase in volume as opposed to just you know, the number of ports that it's going through? Uh, Taiping figure into all of this? Yeah, so um, the first thing, I, let's, let's start with the Taiping, because chronologically that comes straight after. Um, at the same time that the British and French are marching towards Beijing, the Anglo-French garrison in Shanghai was fighting off the attempt by the Taiping to take the city. But simply put, despite, I think, you know, the interesting argument made by some historians like Stephen Platt that, you know, there was still the opportunity for Western neutrality or even outright intervention on behalf of the Taiping um, after the Second Opium War. It's very clear that the provisions of the Second Opium War indicated that Britain was reasonably confident that the Qing would succeed. And when it became apparent that the Taiping might have a chance, which is when they suddenly gained momentum and prepared to attack Shanghai, it seems that Britain and France, having just fought the Qing, were prepared to fight the Taiping in order to safeguard their newfound concessions. So from 1850, um, although it's, there's a policy of sort of biased neutrality until 1862, when the Taiping formally really represent a military threat. Um, Britain and France from 1862 to 1864 officially intervene against the Taiping on the Qing's behalf, simply because, again, there's not that confidence that the Taiping will actually be pliant, so they may as well defend the deal they have rather than encourage a completely uncertain future. Um, as part of this, there is the Qing movement known as self-strengthening, where Qing officials like Zhang Guofan and Li Hongzhang and Zhuo Zongtang, uh, another aside, Zhuo Zongtang is also rendered as something that looks like Zhou Zongtang and is the namesake of General Tso's chicken. Um, these officials were interested in adopting Western weaponry, Western industrial manufacturing, but believe that they could do so without compromising sort of the basic neo-Confucian ideology that they saw as integral to the existence of the Chinese state as it stood. And so what happens during and after the sort of final interventionist phase of the Taiping War is the emergence of a large number of military installations um, sponsored by Western countries. Um, so the major ones are, for example, there's one in Beijing sponsored by the British and one in Fuzhou sponsored by the French. Um, so the interesting thing is that really the Second Opium War is, for the time being, the end of Sino-European antagonism. The Europeans suddenly are pro-Qing within, uh, arguably, at the same time that they were anti-Qing. <laughs> So, one of the things that we mentioned at the very beginning of our discussion was the reaction in subsequent historiography.
um, how this these two wars kickstarted what's known as the century of humiliation. Um, can you describe that both in a general term and then narrow it down a little bit uh, as to how it relates to the Opium War and the immediate aftermath? Yeah. So, I mean, in order to properly discuss national humiliation, we need to talk about a few later events. But I, for now, the key thing is that this notion of national humiliation is the idea that China's foreign wars in the 19th century, which were almost invariably defeats, um, were sort of resulted in a growing sense that China had was in a weak position and that there was a growing sense of indignation about China's position in the world. And that this was a phenomenon that was basically ubiquitous across Chinese society. That's the standard narrative of national humiliation. The century of humiliation is simply its formulation by Mao in such a way that if you start national humiliation with the Treaty of Nanjing in 1842, then the victory of the communists in the Civil War in 1949, you know, bookends that period quite nicely. Um, in the case of, this, of the Opium Wars in particular, I, I, what's quite telling about why the national humiliation angle doesn't quite work is simply A, you see all these sort of less than entirely pro Qing forces, like the San Yuan Li militias, like um, the Chu San officials, like in fact the Canton Kuli Corps, who are active collaborators with the British in the Second War, um, which is suggestive of, a, of the idea that no, not everyone was somehow fundamentally angered by, um, by the successes of Britain in these two wars. In fact, plenty in China were willing to facilitate them. And the other thing you can take exception with is the century thing. As noted, what about British support, British and French really, support for China during the self-strengthening movement? You know, this century of humiliation evidently has a very big gap in it. Um, and an added angle to that is, of course, that it's an angle that doesn't really take into account the whole Manchu Han problem. That you have the Taiping, who are a somewhat nationalist movement. They are anti-Manchu. And you have in Britain and France this understanding that while this is a war being fought in China, there is this question of are we fighting it against specifically the Qing government, or have we decided that we are fighting a war against China? And the attack on the Summer Palace, for example, is a very interesting case of where the British and the French decided, no, we're fighting specifically against the Qing government, because the Qing Summer Palace complex was significantly far away from Beijing. The attack on it was decided basically because the British and the French wanted their troops out of Beijing, where because they didn't want their troops looting the general public in Beijing. They wanted them going after the imperial palaces if they were going to go looting anyway. It's interesting in that one of the things that we talked about earlier was the awareness that the British had of the internal politics of China. Um, did this increase notably in between the two wars? Um, or did they, I mean, I don't want to say that they stumbled upon this policy um, of division. How did this, how did that play out between the two wars and how did it see itself after the wars were over? I think that's something that's quite hard to assess, at least in any sort of quantitative, well, even in a qualitative sense, because, of course, the, the political conditions of China in the 1850s were completely unlike the 1830s. I mean, China in the 1850s is going through a period of civil war. So kind of Britain is obviously, or has additional incentives to watch the situation closely. So I, I think the thing is, it's not necessarily a fair comparison. Um, well, well, sorry, that comes across as maybe accusatory, but it, it's not necessarily... A, an equal comparison, simply because the conditions of the 1850s are so very different. Nevertheless, the British do have better access to information because they have ports further up the coast, including crucially Shanghai, which has access to you know, basically a line of communication along the Yangtze. Um, but the British sent, had not sent any more embassies since the First Opium War, and on top of that, there was no embassy quarter in Beijing. So there was less opportunity for gaining direct knowledge about the politics of the court. Sorry, there was no more opportunity 
than before for gaining opportun- uh, gaining information about the court politics. But in terms of the politics of the interior, certainly I think, yes, for various reasons, some both directly due to the Nanjing settlement and some due to the new conditions that emerged in the 1850s. Um, what were some of the fallouts on Qing court culture? We mentioned that in the first Opium War, a lot of the problems, people didn't want to tell the emperor that they'd lost. Um, that have any new fallout? Uh, how? And we mentioned the court was far more concerned with the Taiping Rebellion than it was the British and French. Did this change at all after the war? Well, I mean, the, the simple point would be, yes, if only for the very simple reason that the Taiping had gone. Um, but uh, in the end, it would have to be said that the internal political crises of the Qing had a far more significant impact on the court of well, the structure of Qing government than the foreign wars. Um, so uh, the major innovation during the Taiping War is the emergence of a large number of gentry and official-led armies that draw mostly from local elites, not from the imperial centre, and where the funding is partly decentralised. And so you end up with sort of an, a loose clique of officials like Zhang Guofan, Li Hongzhang, Zhuo Dongtang, um, that eventually includes other people like eventually the usurper Yuan Shikai, these groups are these groups of officials hold a huge amount of power later on, and instead of being afraid of lying to the emperor, um, they are in fact so independent that um, eventually in the eighteen eighties and nineties, um, Li Hongzhang is negotiating treaties unilaterally. So we've talked about the the fallout of the war, but we mentioned in the treaties that one of the big elephants in the room, or lack of elephants in the room, depending on your view of the war, is that opium is not really addressed. It was legalized by the Qing over the course of the war. What happens to the opium trade after the war is over? You mentioned the French were not particularly involved from it. The Americans were getting their opium from the Ottomans. Um, So how does British involvement in the opium trade change after the Second Opium War. Yeah, so the opium trade doesn't actually continue increasing for that much longer, although, you know, how much longer something is depends on your conception of historical timescales. Um, during the 1850s, the average annual export of opium was about 68,000 chests a year. This increased by an average of 5,000 chests a day. 5,000 chests per annum per decade until the 1890s. Um, So this peaked at about 82,000 chests in 1892. But from then on, there was a significant decline until by the 20th century, um, it was down to about 40,000, which is just a little bit more than what was being exported at the beginning of the First Opium War. Eventually... um, a treaty between Britain and China in 1907 agrees, uh, leads to the agreement that Britain will phase out opium exports to China by 1914. Uh, this isn't quite adhered to. It takes until 1916 for the opium trade to officially end. Um, and during this entire time, huge numbers of people make their fortunes off opium. Uh, not just you know, the old Jardy Matheson Company or the Gigi Boys or the Rustum G's. Um, but also, if you think about World War I poets, um, Siegfried Sassoon's ancestors were opium traders. Um, the, and I, one of the sort of very tragic things about the opium trade is that a huge amount of philanthropy was funded off the back of selling opium in China. Um, Jamsetji Jijiboy, who was the major Parsi trader, um, is remembered in Kolkata today as a major philanthropist for setting up hospitals with his money. Um, so too in Hong Kong for the Rustumjis, also known as the Ruttenjis. Um, Jardines remains one of the biggest companies in the world. So in that sense, although the opium trade is eventually phased out, you can... I mean, any time was too late in one sense. At the same time, though, the legalisation of opium by the Qing led to an immense amount of domestic production, and by the 1870s, 
the production of opium in Sichuan and Yunnan provinces would exceed the amount of imports. Um, by the 1880s, it would be double. And from here on out, the majority of opium being consumed in China was actually homegrown. Um, at the behest of mentioned the fracturing of Qing authority um, and how many of these uh, the landed gentry and these other men who were commanding armies and so on were now acting more and more unilaterally uh, was this growth in domestic production coming from them? Was it coming from um, I don't know how, uh, let me just leave the question there. Is it coming from them? Yeah. Uh, these officials were by and large though defenders of a sort of what they saw as the traditional orthodox neo-confucian order they weren't going to be actively sponsoring opium just for their own finances to quite the same extent uh, to the extent that you would imagine if they were acting purely cynically um it seems simply that it was an organic result of the fact that opium was going to be a highly valuable cash crop so uh, there were a lot of people who were willing to grow opium for money because, basically, it was more efficient to grow opium, sell it, and buy grain than it was to just use the same land to grow grain. Um, but yes, there was a degree to which elites might, may have been incentivized to certainly at least turn a blind eye to opium cultivation uh, because, the, um, because of the introduction of an internal transport tax known as uh, Li Jin, which entitled people to a 1%, uh, which entitled customs officials to a 1% duty on taxes moving through goods stations along major highways. So now that we, so opium production is increasingly moving to the domestic sphere. The Qing are attempting to, we have this, the movement, the self-strengthening to try and adopt these Western methods of both industrialization and warfare, uh, what is the next? What is what comes next for China? Um, does this century of humiliation continue? Is this a later uh, invention of later nationalists? What's what's going on after all of this? Yeah, because the interesting thing that gets noted by uh, has been noted by a couple of historians is that. If you look at China's performance in its foreign wars during the 19th century, in wars that have a principally naval component, the Qing do very badly. But once it comes down to it, in prolonged land campaigns, the Qing don't do particularly poorly at all. And in the 1880s, there's a kerfuffle with Russia known as the Ely Crisis. In the backdrop of the 1860s is um, a major revolt in Turkestan. Um, and indeed a major revolt in Gansu and Shanxi by um, various Muslim minorities who are you know, quite rightfully annoyed that the Qing are sponsoring Han Chinese colonists as a kind of way of relieving pressure on the interior and basically because the Qing may not trust the Han colonists much but they trust them more than the Muslims um, of using Han colonists to brutally crack down on uh, Muslim activities in as in you know, sectarian organization, etc., in these Western regions. And against this backdrop, the Russians step in and take the major mining city of Ili from the Qing, allegedly for safeguarding. Um, but when the Qing retake the Western regions, the Russians refuse to give it up. And what and the Ili crisis doesn't necessarily defuse per se. It's a military standoff where the Qing basically win by having more troops that are relatively modernized in the area. Um, and when later on the Qing fight the French during the Sino-French War of 1884 to 85, um, Qing land forces do reasonably well in Vietnam and very well in Taiwan. It's only the Qing Navy that do does very poorly uh, when the French destroy the Fuzhou fleet, which ironically they had previously sponsored. Um, so, in fact, you know, this notion of national humiliation is complicated by the fact that on a geopolitical level, the French are doing, sorry, the Chinese, the Qing, are doing consistently well through to the early 1890s. So, who's in the 1890s? Japan happens. Um, 
The first Sino-Japanese War is really the watershed moment for all of this. Um, in 1894, the Japanese destroy the Chinese modernized Beiyang fleet at the Battle of the Yellow Sea, and subsequently the Japanese armies marching through Korea, which they quote-unquote liberate from Qing overlordship, um, destroy the semi-modernized Huai army of Li Hongzhang. The Before we move on, when you say semi-modernized, what does that mean? So the Huai army was mostly armed with Western rifles and Western artillery, but because the Qing had been sourcing their weapons from a huge number of places and was not consistently updating things, um, these were rifles that and artillery that could range in vintage anywhere from you know the latest gear to you know mini A stuff imported from America after the Civil War. Okay, um, continue. Um, the defeat of the Qing armies is immense in terms of its scale. I mean, the Huai army is effectively disbanded as a result of it, and the Qing court is forced to concede in the Treaty of Shimonoseki. I say the Qing court is forced to concede, in fact, Li Hongzhang has, is basically the fall guy for it. And unlike all the previous treaties, Li Hongzhang has to go to Shimonoseki himself to sign it, whereas all the previous treaties were signed on Chinese soil. Um, the treaty, I mean, basically just makes Japan one of the treaty powers like Britain and France, etc. Um, its, its deals aren't hugely worse than what had come before, but again, there are yeah, just more treaty ports and um, a major indemnity. The, the major losses, really, are the cession of the Pescadores Islands and Taiwan, and the recognition of, quote-unquote, Korean sovereignty. The interesting thing is that the Koreans had actually disliked the Qing for some years, because the Koreans saw the Manchus as having overthrown the Ming, who had protected them against the Japanese the first time, so, in the 1590s. So, um, the Koreans actually erected what was, what's known as the Independence Gate after the Japanese overran Korea and kicked, you know, semi-officially kicked the Manchus out. I mean, this can be gone into a completely different time. But, uh, simply put, the provisions of the treaty aren't necessarily huge, but clearly there's been an intellectual shift in China. Radical intellectuals living in regions that are increasingly affected by foreign trade are also increasingly resistant to these foreign concessions. And for Japan, a country that had been, you know, a lesser regional power in Asia since time immemorial to be the one foisting these concessions evidently had a huge impact. Um, that's not to say there wasn't any precedent at all. Um, in 1884, after the French destroyed the Fuzhou fleet, um, when they attempted to get refueled and repaired in Hong Kong, the local dock workers went on strike in solidarity with um, dock workers in Fuzhou. But What's really interesting in 1895, after the signing of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, is that um, the exam class of 1895, who were in Beijing at the time, petitioned the emperor to refuse to ratify the treaty and to continue the war. With what army was not made clear, but needless to say, there is a huge reaction to the Japanese victory. And this attitude eventually morphs over the next decade or so. During the early 20th century, before the fall of the Qing, national humiliation as something much older starts to emerge. There's this attempt to sort of claim actions like the Sanyuan Li incident and even the Taiping Rebellion as having always been somehow inherently anti-imperial, and by anti-imperial, sort of anti-foreign imperialist. And so, kind of, the Opium Wars get influenced, get viewed through a post Sino Japanese war lens. And this continues on into the early Republic. The interesting thing is that it's not until the early 20th century, in fact, that the term unequal treaty was even coined to describe these earlier treaties. And the first use of Opium War in Chinese was in the 1920s, as Basically, 
the genuine severity of uh, China's geopolitical situation, where it was increasingly influenced by powers like Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and especially Japan, was really setting in. And there were these attempts to basically go, let's look at these past events that are examples of this as well. How in the long run do we deal with it? And the answer for some was constitutional reform. The answer for some was Republican revolution. And after the Republican revolution, the problems were still happening. So, yeah, the going back to the opium wars and the unequal treaties was kind of almost a a tool for trying to reckon with contemporary political concerns and actually somewhat divorce from the realities on the ground at the time. Right, and so uh, how does this, we talked about you, you're, this growing narrative of the century of humiliation starts to grow after the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, how does this, how does this reach its final form that we see today after, you know, after the Republic, then you have Civil War, then World War II, and then nationalists versus the communists, and eventually the communists take over of China. Uh, how does this? How do? How? What is their input on this? How does they? How does the communist government view the century of humiliation, and what does that mean for it up to historiography up to today? So I think a very interesting thing to illustrate the gradual evolution of ideas um, is a film from 1944. Um, it was made in Shanghai by collaborationists with Japan, and it depicts a scene. It depicts a period in the Taiping Rebellion when a Japanese delegation visited Shanghai. And in this film, the rallying cry is for the Taiping and the Qing to stop fighting each other and unite with their fellow Asian countries to fight the British and the Americans. So this is an obvious case of this transposition of kind of the opium war type of period onto present day concerns in the case of the Second World War, with the Taiping and Qing being stand-ins for the communists and the nationalists. The, the interesting thing that is, though, that during the war itself, only the collaborationists are particularly making use of the opium war for propaganda value, because of course they're the only ones who aren't allied with the United Kingdom and the United States. <laughs> the nationalists very much ease off on the opium war rhetoric and go to actually Taiping era rhetoric. Um, in fact, not so much the Taiping, but the Qing, um, going for Qing loyalism and the defense of order, whereas the communists went for the Taiping themselves, this sort of radical social program. It's not until really in 1945 when the communists turn against the nationalists and vice versa and become enemies of the Americans again that then more strongly anti-imperial rhetoric comes to the fore and this resumes especially hard during the Korean War when basically the Chinese war effort is spun as defending Korea against American imperialism. But the Opium War itself is not necessarily the only sole focus. Um, if you look at the Monument to the People's Heroes in Tiananmen Square, um, it has a sequence of events that it regards as sort of the progression of the century of humiliation. And it's eight events, including the 1911 revolution, the communist takeover. The first event is the destruction of the opium by Lin Zersu in 1839. But the second is the Taiping. And basically all of these little events are part of a wider narrative in which the Opium Wars are just one path. So it's really actually relatively recently that a specific focus on the Opium Wars and a general elision of the Qing's own civil war in the 1850s and 60s and even 70s um, has occurred. And um, one perspective argued by Julia Lovell is it has to do a lot with the Tiananmen Square Massacre that that occurred on the 150th anniversary of the destruction of the opium in 1839. So what the communist government did after the Tiananmen Square massacre was very much ha latch onto the 150th year of the opium war as kind of a, a new common enemy type rallying cry in the wake of the massive domestic debacle that had been the 1989 protests. 
And so, in many ways, this is this modern laser focus on the Opium Wars as this period of foreign humiliation can be regarded, if you're being particularly cynical, as kind of a very effective tool whereby the communist government has deflected from its own domestic issues over the years. Um, if you want to be less cynical, there is genuinely, you know, it, it's it's imperialism. It is it is ge genuinely a bad thing with a capital B and capital T. And I suppose in trying to discuss kind of the what really happened, what were contemporary perspectives angle of things, one does have to also not legitimise imperialistic apologia in in the process. That that gets us along to uh, probably the final topic. Um, how has perception of the Opium Wars changed in the West? Yeah, after all, the Western powers were the ones who were waging the war, and you mentioned that in the aftermath of the First War, there was a general good feeling about war that it, um, it especially amongst the British. Um, so how is this? How is perception of the war and its place in both the history of imperialism and Chinese history been shaped in the West ever since? Yeah. So looking within the 19th and early 20th centuries, before you have this actual serious academic study of China being formalized um, at Harvard in the 1930s and 40s, is this emergence of the yellow peril narrative. The thing about the yellow peril narrative is that, well, it's, it's the very basic idea of it was this sort of almost social Darwinist notion of an eventual race war between Asians and Europeans. And it was not one in which it was confidently believed that Europeans would win. One of the big sort of motivating ideas behind Yellow Peril was this notion that the defeats that the Europeans had inflicted on China during the 19th century, you know, from the Opium Wars up to and including, say, the Boxer Rebellion, were eventually going to be avenged. So the emergence of these sort of subversive actors in popular media, like especially Fu Manchu, um, was an expression of quite acute cultural fears that basically all of this imperialistic warmongering was going to bite everyone in the arse. And when the Boxer Rebellion happens, I mean, the reason there is such mass panic is that in some ways it feels like everything has come true, that China has risen up against the foreign invader, and basically all these advantages that they have tried to work for are all going to be gone, and everyone's going to be massacred. So in this regard, the Opium Wars do form a sort of proto-century of humiliation narrative in which there's kind of a, a sense that Europe did hugely disrupt China. Um, and this is what gets picked up, especially in Japan as well, and from Japan moves over to Chinese emigre intellectuals, and that then gets spun into the major century of humiliation narrative later on. Um, yeah, basically this sense that this is the rude awakening, this is the moment in which China enters the modern world, and that Europe chose to be, well, chose to be aggressive in its way of doing it, and China is seeking revenge. Proper academic study, of course, really begins later on, and that moderates its opinion somewhat. I mean, the big figure here is John King Fairbank, who did still regard the Opium War as the beginning of modern Chinese history, because in his own view, <clears throat> kind of modern history is based on Eurocentric metrics, and the quote-unquote opening of China due to the, opening, the Opium War was what kicked off modern China. And this was a view that was very prevalent up until you know, the 1980s, and it was modified in various ways. I mean, Fairbank preferred what he called a sort of impact response approach, which was kind of a, what happens in the 19th century is European power does something, China makes some response. And the sort of grand imperialist critique of this, sorry, not imperialist, quote, unquote, imperialism critique of this was basically to say, but these responses are so conditioned by the initial European actions that you can't act like China is a fully independent actor. And then the response to all of this is Paul A. Cohen coming up 
and arguing for the sort of China-centric approach. Uh, and I mean, Cohen isn't doing this alone. He's actually drawing on some, you can call it slightly experimental scholarship, but his argument is very much, you have to look at things from a Chinese perspective, look at domestic Chinese forces. And he argues for backdating the quote-unquote late Qing period from 1839 all the way back to 1800. So in this regard, actually, the Opium War loses its significance in historiography because it gets seen as sort of part of the general process of what's going on in China in the 19th century. But uh, since Cohen, there has been somewhat more of a move towards seeing the Qing Empire less as China, which is what I said really early on, um, because what that does is it clues you into seeing all of the, of the Qing's frontier relations as part of a broader network of ongoing processes. And so, for example, Peter Perdue, who specialises in Qing relations in Inner Asia, um, has sort of suggested actually looking more to the late 1820s as the start of this important period, because it's when the breakdown starts to happen in Central Asia. And really what happens in coastal China is sort of the second iteration of an already ongoing issue, but which isn't quite as early as 1800. So in that sense, the Opium War in the sort of grand historical narrative of the Qing dynasty do lose a lot of their significance. And I mean, from my own personal opinion, quite rightly so, they aren't that big in and of themselves. The Opium Wars need, as I think I should have demonstrated from all I've said, to be seen as a bigger pattern of, of events going on as early as the foundation of the Qing dynasty, if not before, and where our perception of it is heavily clouded by what comes afterward. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.